It was nice, but I didn't get the one that I was favoured for, sacked by Christmas. But, you know, I got everything else. Ange Postacoglu, after receiving his Manager of the Year award. Welcome along to the Huddle Breakdown. Ender here with you alongside Juco James and Alan Morrison. As usual, this week we are celebrating Celtic clinching the cinch, albeit there is two games to go. And Rangers can level with points on Celtic, but with the goal difference, Celtic are champions elect off the SPFL. Who would have thought we were going to be sitting here in this position, uh, James, at the start of the season after last year when we actually celebrated our first time being top of the table on this podcast, January this season. So compare that to January last year and how we ended the season last year. I don't think any of us expected to be sitting in this position where Ange Postacoglu, the new manager replacing Neil Lennon, was manager of the year as Celtic claim the title. Yeah, I think uh, particularly in the first uh, six weeks of the season, that seemed um, a stretch, even even for uh, the spreadsheet virgins of us who were uh, analyzing things at the time. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I think the uh, the totality of uh, the transfer window closing, and I think it's kind of easy to forget that two of the most important guys came in at the last hour or at least the last day in Jota and and Carter Vickers. Um, Carter Vickers maybe being seminal in the sense that that deal seemed to be really thrown together together at the last minute, Uh, you know, kind of scrambling at the end to get it over the line. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's just been uh, kind of a whirlwind – the dichotomy between the, the 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 European campaign versus the domestic consistency, uh, kind of coming out of that initial period, uh, has been fascinating, and again contributed to the the roller coaster in a, in a way. Um, so yeah, it's it's just been a really uh, entertaining season all around, uh, including you know some hair raising parts that. Um, I, I would argue from pure entertainment perspective added to the experience, meaning that, um, you know, it's fun to win leagues by 20, 20 points over Aberdeen and Motherwell. But, um, you know, that's not quite as exciting as, uh, you know, from an entertainment perspective as far as the kind of um, let, let's call it the redemption over over last season and how this has played out. Mm. Yeah, I think if you were to give me a list of things that I wanted Celtic to do at the start of the season. Number one would have been reconnect the team with the fans. That's been definitely done uh, twice over by Antoine Cicoglu and this team. And the second would be to have won a trophy that was done with the League Cup and now it's going to be done uh, a second time with the, the League title. Alan, James raised a very interesting point. It's something that's sort of, uh, it's a hot topic right now when you're looking at, at other teams south of the border with Pep Guardiola's Man City getting knocked out of the Champions League last week, but again, their dominance over the Premier League and the league title um, continues. And this it's a theme of Pep Guardiola and post-Messi, really, that he can win the league very, very well and very dominantly. But when it comes to the Champions League, he falls and stutters and makes weird choices. With Celtic, I'm not going to say that that's something that happened this year, but if you compare us to Rangers on that aspect, Rangers have very much being a cup team, being quite dominant in the Europa League, especially compared to what Celtic have achieved. But Celtic, on the other hand, have been a very good league team, especially this season. So I'm interested to get your thoughts on league versus cup and maybe an analytical viewpoint on that and how they differ in your mind. Yeah, I mean, well, firstly, the Champions League is incredibly difficult to win. So the fact that Manchester City haven't won it under Guardiola is probably a little bit surprising given the amount of money that they invest in that team, but then a lot of other teams invest quite a lot of money as well. And it's a bit like these, um, I'm always intrigued when, when people start posting up these, oh, look at Celtic's wage bill. It's 25 million times more than Aberdeen's. Of course, they're going to win the league. And and, then, and that's a really good debate to have, actually. But I think there's an, a level of of, of um, quantum above which you're outspending your opposition that it probably the, it marginally doesn't matter anymore. And I suspect what Manchester City are finding is that, yes, they, they can dominate and win 7-0 against Watford, 
but it, is it actually good enough to consistently beat Bayern Munich and Real Madrid? Well, no, not really, <laughs> you know, because they, they're still pretty expensively assembled sides as well, and I've got lots of good players. So it's not it's not as straightforward as whilst having a financial advantage should confer you, uh, and, and and all the all the evidence and the data suggests that when it's quantums of amounts, you know, do Cel do Celtic win the league by? I think it's I think I, don't, I can't remember what the actual true value is i think our wage bill is something like four times that of aberdeen do we get four times the number of points no okay so it's not a direct correlation okay it, it isn't and so so it's, it's it's not i don't i think it's a more subtle and it's a, it's a it's a topic that probably and i'm probably straying into james's territory here he's probably far more uh, competent to uh analyze this this relationship between spend and 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 success than i am but but it's certainly more subtle than just saying you spent this much, therefore you get this many points and and you will have more points than the opposition. So I think that's what a little bit of what we're seeing uh, with Man City, and and it also for the rest of Scotland, it means that you know Celtic won't necessarily win everything as they as they haven't done over the last few uh, few years. I know we had the, the travel tra the travel travel seasons, but before that um, there was a big structural advantage, and, and and different teams won cups for different reasons because cups are are. Are tricky, and there's, and, and I think you know, you know, you mentioned uh, the Rangers there, uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this out of hubris. It's just a genuine observation. Is there's different ways to get through these competitions? Okay, if you look at their record, they've pretty much won as many games as they've lost in Europe this season, and yet they've managed to navigate a way through the rounds, which is you know fair enough. I mean, that's that the objective is to get through the tie, not to win all, not to win all the games. So it's not, it's not a criticism. It's just an observation of. There's different ways of getting through these competitions, as opposed to Frankfurt, who actually are unbeaten. Does that mean that, that Frank will, will, will win the final? No, it doesn't, because <laughs> they're probably quite evenly matched, matched teams. So, com you know, cup football is complicated, and we've seen that, and we've seen with with Real Madrid even that you know I don't I can't remember what their results were in the group stages, but I think they they, they weren't I think they, they took a few beatings. Um, yeah, they and lost and, and, to uh, they lost to Sheriff, who were that's like, right at uh, home. Yeah, and, and away, the, the lowest ranked team in the competition. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so you know, we're, we're at that one. Out. It's cup football, right? So this this is going to happen. You know, um, all all players are capable of raising the game. You know, for one game in, in in a cup in a cup match. That's why they're so dangerous. Um, so I think I think it's you, I think with the other the other lens, I would look at it through through this this question that you asked me in terms of because I think it's kind of hinting towards. You know why have Celtic been dominant in the in the in the league and consistent? And I think this is I think this is really fascinating. Why why is Postecoglou been able to implement a really really consistent team now? Because every week now we're getting about a couple of goals more xG than the opposition. We're getting really consistent performances. We're not giving up many chances. We're creating loads of chances, and, and it's pretty much game on game that, that that's happening versus versus in Europe. And I think it's just it's it's, it's he's got a he's got a good system, uh, and the system. Strength, the strength of the system, the strength of the collective is good enough to dominate Scotland, but the individual weaknesses of the players isn't good enough to transfer to, to Europe. And you're comparing them to a, a Rangers side that is probably, I would say, just, it's just more, it's a more experienced side, and it, but it's also been coached in a different way. It's been coached in a far more pragmatic way in terms of um, being set up to to really cater for the weaknesses of the opposition, whereas we've tended to, Apostokogu's approach is still, although he does tweak things, is still very much geared towards we will do our thing and you try and stop us. And I'm yeah. not sure that translates well against good European opposition, is my honest assessment. And I think that's something we need to grasp that, that debate going forward for next season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very much pragmatism over dogma really when you think about the the different approaches from the two clubs and um, before we get into the hearts game because i do want to get into it it was a really interesting game in many ways and a really brilliant performance from celtic in the second half in particular but uh, james this show is uh, an analytical based show it's something that you and alan put, pour your heart into across the season i i have to I hold my hands up i don't do any of the hard work when it comes to collecting any of the data in this i just turn up and try to be somewhat coherent when it comes to the show but at this stage of the season this is where you look back at not just the fixtures because i i think most people will look back and look at the results and look at uh whether celtic won against dundee united at home or won against rangers in this game here and there but we when we track the data and the underlying metrics across the season. This is where you're seeing the results of 
the you know the the six xg that we put up at the start of the season and continue to do so throughout the year what i'm trying to say is uh one game xg really means nothing but when you combine all the games then together you start to see the trend and start to see why celtic are in the position that they're in and the likes of the cynic who have been doing an x points uh table throughout the year that's why you're seeing celtic were at the top at the start and now are continue to be at the top and are near enough the same amount of points that they expected to get. So it, from an analytical perspective, this must be a really interesting part of the season for you guys. Yeah, it, it is. Um, because, and this comes back to, the, I'll, I'll uh, maybe revert back to your question to Alan about the difference between cup and, uh, and league. Uh, and this actually goes all the way back to, um, you know, money ball and baseball as well. Which is the Oakland A's, who were the, uh, you know, the, the the case study, so to speak, in the book and the movie. Um, they were able to optimize in baseball. It's a 162 game season. That is a lot of games, right? That's a lot of games. That's why they, Alan's look. Many. That that's what they <laughs> that's call like it. America's sport, right there. <laughs> that's why they call it a lifestyle sport, Alan. Uh, it's almost, it's, it's, called almost fleece, it's called fleecing people, James. right? Right? No, no, no. Well, th- and that th- that goes back like that. That yeah. goes all the way back uh, over a hundred years. They used to play 154, so it's always been like that. Um, uh, and th- they were able to optimize over a 162 game season to really outperform using these, you know, analytical edges. But when they got into the playoffs. Right. And if you think of that, you know, like a, a seven game series in baseball is kind of like the on a, on a proportional basis, you know, seven versus 162, one versus 38 or two versus 38. Um, a lot of those uh, edges become less important because you have so much variance. You have so many things that can change and go go wrong or different. Um you know the, the the randomness really picks up, and and um, you know th- there's just part of that. You you can try to reduce that risk, and I talked about this last season with Lenny Ball, uh, and why Lennon's style of managing created more variance in cup games, and his track record in cup games hadn't been very good actually um, over the duration of his two tenures. Whereas if you have more of a controlled style. Um, you're more likely to have lower variance and, and, um, you know, uh, and, and that also depends on whether you're the underdog versus the favorite. If you're the underdog variance is a good thing, uh, because you know, you, 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 you can have some luck break your way. Whereas if you're the favorite, you want to kind of squeeze that out. And if you look at the duration of the season for Celtic, what, what I actually, one of the things I got wrong early in the season was, um, the concept of kind of Ange ball having more volatility to it. And I think we saw that in Europe very much. So the case, but the, the, the overlay of the gap in quality between Celtic versus most of the domestic league, we were able to squeeze out that volatility to a large degree. We were able to get that XG differential up almost two um, in, in, on an, on an average basis, which that is really hard to drop points in any kind of size when, when you have that kind of uh, gap and consistently, right? So again, you got to look at not only the average, but the distribution and the volatility of the, so we've been so consistent in squeezing. And again, to Alan's point, I think that had a lot to do. And I've been, you know, raving about it for months now that I think that uh, Ange should be getting even more credit than he has. I mean, I I think uh, not only from the repairing of, um, some of the, the issues with the support um, and his kind of cult of personality that he has. Uh, but this ability to just manage the team to the point where we squeeze that out. I mean, that, the, the application of, of his strategy and how he's managed games, the style of play with the talent we have, the quality gap that we do have over um, 10 other teams in the league – it, it, I, I don't see this changing. I, in fact, I think it's going to compound dramatically next season with an, the second season under Ange and another window with hopefully it looks like Champions League money. I mean, next season is going to be an unfair, crazy fight between the 10 teams in the league. And, you know, assuming 
you know, even theoretically, if Rangers win the Europa League final, that's two teams with Champions League money against not very well run 10 other teams on a lot less money, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be even more important next season, probably, as far as squeezing out those points and not dropping points to Ross County, right? And to me, that was probably the epitome of the season. Um, and I wrote a piece at the beginning of, of the season talking about the back to the future, right? Which is just normal variance, some, you know, little fine margins determining the league between two teams that are relatively close on a quality basis. And, you know, up in Dingwall, we get a late header by Tony Ralston that, that wins a game. That's a two point swing. And, uh, Rangers go up to Dingwall and Alan McGregor dumps two balls that basically gift two goals to them. And it ends up a draw, 3-3 three, three draw for them. That's a four-point swing. Just that, just those two small instances, let alone Boyce missing a penalty again, you know, it hits the post and barely could have dribbled over and didn't, right? That would have been another two points. So these are the fine margins that we're talking about. Even over 38 games, where you know the league could that's a six-point swing right there. You know, again, you could pick these things. I'm just saying that you know, you just have a small amount of variance over 38 games, let alone in cup football, where it's you know, one or two games. Um, so it's remarkable, the consistency and the fact that we've been able to really squeeze this out and uh, to the point where I, I suspect it'll be similar next season. Um, because I, I the, 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 the equation of, you know, what, what it's going to be like versus the rest of the league, I don't think is changing. I know this has been long-winded. I have one anecdote I wanted to share, um, and then I'll shut up for a while, is... Uh, an analogy I think it kind of conceptualizes if you're an audiophile or even if you're not quality of speakers, right? You buy a $50 pair of speakers and you can tell the difference between that and like a $500 pair of speakers, right? There's that difference. But when you get into these audiophiles that spend like $10,000 on speakers, like the difference to the average person can't hear the, you know, really between a $500 or a $1,000 speaker and a $50,000 speaker. And that's to Alan's point. The, these relationships in football and sports are not linear. And, and the difference between getting, you know, that top, 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 top player and the next echelon down, like a Man City's getting versus like an Atletico Madrid or some of these other clubs, when you overlay that difference isn't that big with the normal volatility of cup football. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, you know, that's why you get these big swings in, in results in, in, in cups. Um because there's not that big of a difference. Yeah. And I think that's why you'll always have, and I know you don't particularly like it. I think that's why you'll always have the cult of the manager in football because of how small those margins are, because mm -hmm. the likes of say Simeone, who is, um, you know, known for volatility and creating chaos is, is going to bring something different to the table and bring a different style. But we'll park that conversation for another while, because there is a game to get into Celtic were victors over hearts at the weekend. It looked, like it was all going to collapse on our face. Um, I missed the first 10 minutes of the game. I got the notification that Hearts had taken the lead. I looked on Twitter. I checked that Hearts, people felt that Hearts deserved the lead after just six six minutes, I think, the first goal went in on. Um, but Alan, Celtic really took a grasp of this game. Once they, they scored, they dominated. And once again, Dyson made a, the Jota, all these players, they turned up when you wanted them to turn up. And they really put on a show in that second half by firstly outworking the opposition um, massively. I, I, it was one of those performances, again, where Celtic were just consistently going at it and going at it and attacking and attacking and attacking. And there was a couple of goals, even disallowed. Jota had a goal disallowed in the second half as well, where Celtic were just relentless. They didn't stop in this game. Um, once they got a grasp of it, this was a very dominant Celtic performance. Yeah, it, it was probably the first ten minutes that were a bit a bit edgy. I mean, they actually pressed up quite high, um, but the, the, and the but the main reason that Celtic had problems in this game for the first thirty minutes, really, before we got a grip of it and, and got back into it, was just just it was very simple. It was just poor passing. Our passing was just much much uh, under par. I mean, you had players like McGregor that gave the ball away nine times. In the first half, which is unheard of, <laughs> you know, he normally he's like his normal sort of stats would be, you know, hundred completed passes and maybe give away six or seven over over ninety minutes, but he gave away the ball nine times in the first half alone. Um, Starfelt gave the ball away six times from passes in the first half, which again, generally he keeps it really simple. 
Maeda gave the ball away 10 times in the first half. So basically that whole, that kind of left corridor, which is where, you know, Starfelt, McGregor, Maeda, it was was completely, you know, and that's where Celtic are, are, are still remain quite a left-sided dominant team because O'Reilly and Jota weren't getting into the game in that first period. Um, we were just giving the ball away. It was really as simple as that. Hearts weren't doing anything particularly complicated or aggressive in terms of pressing. We just simply weren't good enough in possession. It was it was just really poor. And once the once the passing improved, then we started to create uh, chances. Um, and again, I'm 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 not deliberately oversimplifying. I just genuinely see that that's that's really what it, that's really what it what it was. Um, and then in the second half, you know, we're 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 we we. Did that wonderful thing where where they where they had a, a little five minute spell where we couldn't get out. There were a few corners and there was crosses coming in all over the place and none of them were connecting. And then we scored, so we immediately killed any any sort of hope they'd had with that third goal. And the substitutes with that stage and the fresh legs that Celtic came on meant they were just then to, able to come at them uh, from from all angles. But yeah, the, the, we caused our own problems uh, we, we, because the passing was poor. That was really what the first sort of thirty minutes was about. Yeah, the starting lineup was quite interesting, mainly in the midfield, because, I mean, we, we discussed this uh, at length on the show last week, but it was David Turnbull that got the nod ahead of Rio Hattati in midfield, along with Matt O'Reilly and Cal McGregor, as usual. You mentioned the substitutions there, just a brief point on them. If you look at who Celtic took off the bench, Jack Amakis, who has double figures goals this year, Leila Bada, the same, Tom Rogic, you know, nominated for player of the season, Rio Hattati and James Forrest, that's incredible in terms of the talent that you're taking off the bench, especially in, in comparison to the opposition. So, again, substitutions tend to uh, win a lot of games. I'm not saying they completely won this game because, I mean, you know, Jack Mack has got his goal, but the game was put to bed before all those subs went on. But the difference in bringing the, those players on control-wise um, is absolutely incredible compared to last season. But, we'll, James, we'll start with the, the midfield. David Turnbull comes in, Matt O'Reilly comes in. Cal McGregor playing as usual. It is interesting that, like Alan pointed out here, that Celtic were poor in possession because, you know, David Turnbull in comparison to Rio Atate, you would probably associate as more of a controlled player. Yeah, and I, I think the the, the poorness was, uh, as Alan said, relatively early. And then as we settled down, um, you know, over time, I, I, I think that uh, got, got a lot better. You know, uh, hearts, much to my uh, delight, did not set up as I had feared they would. So uh, kind of like Ross County, um, you know, I find it amusing. Some some of these opposing managers seem to think that they can mimic how Rangers get some uh, <laughs> some joy against us in defending. And they try to do it and then it works for a, a relatively short period of time. And then we just blow their doors off. And that, that was kind of the same um, timeline of this game again, where the talent's point, I mean, they... They tried. They're not terribly good. And we talked about this in the kind of previewing the game. Their midfield's not all that athletic. And, um, you know, the idea of them pressing us aggressively uh, for any significant portion of the game was, I think, predictably not going to be a good outcome for them. But, you know, we'd still have our issues at the back. And, uh, you know, with Dranovich out, that probably gets compounded. So, you know, we're a little bit and again, sloppy passing, particularly from McGregor. So I, I thought Turnbull and O'Reilly, for the most part, were OK early. I mean, it really was kind of the back. Let's call it six, if you include McGregor, <laughs> as far as uh, getting that ball through into midfield. Um, and then once that kind of cleaned up and parts fatigued and then we kind of controlled the game more in the middle to the front uh, th third of the pitch. I mean, it was basically um, a walk in the park. Um, and that that allowed a little bit more of this creativity than the blossom and, um, you know, some of the, the, the nice triangles and uh, the more fluidity of, of the style of play that made it really entertaining after that first half hour. Uh, so, yeah, I thought Turnbull and O'Reilly were both pretty good. And then once McGregor kind of, you know, settled into the game, then it was kind of fatal complete, I think. Mm. On that point, Rob McEwen is in the comments, and if you are watching live on YouTube, do leave us a comment. We'll try to get someone to some of them before the end of the show. Uh, but Rob makes the point that Turnbull, Calmack, and O'Reilly could be a dream midfield for the next four seasons. Uh, Turnbull and O'Reilly will still only be around 25, 26. Now, what we have mentioned before about 
you know, O'Reilly and Turnbull and even Tom Rogic, if you add him into the mix, is that at least with Rio Hotata, you're adding pace, you're adding aggression in the press. Um, is that what's missing for that trio of O'Reilly, Turnbull and McGregor to make it actually the dream midfield for Celtic? Uh, again, I think so. At a, I think you made a good point, Ender, that you know, with Turnbull and certainly in the domestic setting, you're probably adding a bit more control. Um, he's still got the range of passing, and in fact, you know, he, I thought he played really well. He set up, I think, three chances, which was the highest in the team, and he his pack passing score was the highest in the team, not by much, by like a, by one, one by one point, I guess, but still, um, that was a good return for his first start for a long time, actually. So that that was really promising. So you can see again. In, in a dominant Celtic team against the likes of Hearts or, or even some of the lesser teams, that is going to be a really nice midfield, actually. Uh, you've, you've got some real creativity in, in there. Uh, but but what you're going to lack again in Europe um, is whereas O'Re- I thought O'Reilly, some of O'Reilly's defensive interventions were absolutely incredible. There was a period in the second half where I think he got on the end of three crosses into the box and intercepted or, or cleared them from, from Hearts. Um, he won a couple of balls back in his own half. He won the ball back up or counter press at least once as well. So his defensive actions were again were, were there were a lot of them and they were effective, but he's not quick. <laughs> and 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 Turnbull doesn't have that defensive intensity, nor is he quick either. So again, if you think of you know what would be a model for this, and there's, there's probably m- many, but but let, let's 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 take an extreme to make the point. If you think about Liverpool, right, four three three. OK, you've got four, three attackers that have got a lot of freedom to get forward. And I know, I know, I know Postecoglou is probably more, more plays that plays in the style of Man City. I'm not saying Celtic are as good as Man City, I'm saying that the style of. Um, but Liverpool play that 4-3-3. And the midfield, generally, uh, because the full-backs are so um, productive in terms of an attacking sense, that they, they, with the three forwards, are almost your five attackers. The, the midfield three are charged with really doing a lot of the ground covering, the space filling, uh, with the ball retention, the ball recycling. And they're generally all quite, you know, athletic, um, you know, muscular, as well as being, you know, decent footballers. I mean, you know, Jordan Henderson, <laughs> I don't think anyone's idea of a, of a terrific footballer. And yet, you know, he's, 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 he's given him a new lease of life because under Klopp, he doesn't have to be an expansive player. He just has to get about the pitch, get tackles in, win it, give it simple. Um, now that's not how Celtic play, but you get, the point I'm trying to make is, um, if you're going to play expansive football and you're going to have your fullbacks involved in attacking moves, someone's going to have to fill the gaps. Someone's going to have to make the recovery lens, and that's why you need that athleticism that we keep talking about. I don't mean I'm not talking about Wimbledon football here. I'm talking about mm-hmm. recovery speed. I'm talking about not being out muscled in challenges in the air. I'm talking about when people are breaking on you, you 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 can get there. You can get there quicker. So, uh, and, and just physic, you know, physicality, which we know the Celtic team lacks. So, if it's not in the forward areas, where does it come from? So, um, yeah, I still I, I love you know Turnbull O'Reilly, beautiful footballers. I think will have great utility, especially domestically. But again, I think we need to rethink if we want to compete at Champions League level in terms of getting that mix between sort of silk and steel, if you like, especially in mm. the midfield area. Yeah, it comes down to the manager as well in the style of football. Because, I mean, if you give Brendan Rodgers, for example, the midfield trio of Cal McGregor, Matt O'Reilly and David Turnbull, I think that's an absolutely exceptional midfield. And he would really make stars out of those players the way that he plays through the midfield so much. But with Postacoglu, you do want those workhorses. And Jordan Henderson is the perfect example of, you know, the style. You don't, you can thrive. If you compare him to Steven Gerrard at Liverpool and what he achieved... In comparison, if you ask anybody who was a better player, I mean, it's Gerard, but who was more successful? Jordan Henderson, because he did a role in a very good team. Mm-hmm. So um, anyway, leaving Liverpool and especially Gerard aside and to the, <laughs> the side of our mayors, James, you, you look like you're wanting to come in on this. Yeah, the only thing I'll say is uh, to uh, ho- hopefully kind of, um, because I, I, I agree with Alan. I, I think we've talked about this on prior shows about um, probably one of our greatest needs is getting more athleticism at the European level. Uh, in the midfield um, is, and uh, there aren't too many people probably that have been as big of um, advocates of, of McGregor playing as the number six over the, over recent seasons as, as I have. Um, But he is going to be 29 next month. Um, And that means he's not going to be getting faster. 
Uh, he's in fact going to start to slow on the margins, not a lot. He brought, he already is meaning that, you know, got people typically start a slow decline between 26 to 28. And then it starts to pick up a little bit, 29, 30, and then, you know, 32 is kind of when it starts to accelerate, um, from a fast twitch muscle, you know, that real burst that, that obviously you really want to have in midfield and it's not that he can't or he won't it's just on when you're talking about fine margins on the european level a marginally slower mcgregor next season also has to be factored in the equation relative to who the other two midfielders are and how we're going to defend again within the context of playing in a style of play where transitions and defending them are going to be vitally important at that level um so I just wanted to throw that out there is, you know, we're, we're probably already seeing the best of McGregor in that specific component of his, his play. And it's, it's probably not going to get better. Yeah. He may get smarter though. That's the, that's the only thing that tends Absolutely. to happen when, when once a player starts to slow, then he starts using his brain a little bit more. So we'll, we'll, we'll probably see an evolution of McGregor over the next couple of years, to, depending on what happens with the squad and what, what goes on there. But uh, in terms of the hearts game, then Alan, what else w- were you noticing from this game? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we talked about, um, I think the way that we, we, you know, there was contribution across the board again, in terms of, the the goal threat you know we're we're not relying on uh, on one person um you know Kyogo got got back on the on the scoring charts Yota got two assists Turnbull set up the most chances um O'Reilly scored a goal um you know Jackamaka scored a goal Forrest came on and actually created a couple of chances and and so and, and had a couple of shots so there was just yeah, across the board there there was just that that level of threat which and I think that's 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 really gratifying to see. You know, we're not we're not relying. If one of the, if one of those players wasn't playing, you know, you wouldn't be concerned that we there would still be there would be a lack of chances being being uh, created. So I think that was that was the other aspect of I think that that pleased me in in particular. Um, other, otherwise, no. I think uh, you know, I think it's good to come back from from being a goal down because, like you say, you're sort of thinking, well, actually, if we do lose this game, and then we draw the next one, and then we lose the last one. We're going to lose the league, and these, these sort of horrible thoughts. <laughs> these, kind of, these kind of thoughts go start going through your mind. That actually, this could this couldn't be beyond the realms of possibility. So to have a to have a come from behind uh, win uh, was also also gratifying. But as I say, I think it was that attacking threat and the and the variety that, that really pleased me. Yeah, keeping us on our toes. Celtic mm. could have scored about four goals in the last ten minutes. You know, Jota had that one disallowed. Jakimakis got his goal in the ninetieth minute. Abada was through on goal at one point in time as well. Hearts were playing a high line in the last it ten is. minutes, it is. really high line, incredible like offside trap at four one or three one down at the time before Jakimakis got the fourth. So, I mean, brave but stupid, James. Yeah, I, uh, Hearts. Um, hearts are an interesting case study this season. Um, I think, you know, in the um, kind of legacy narrative driven world, um, their manager gets a lot of credit that I suspect he doesn't deserve Um, (laughs) in, you know, getting them back up, which hello, they should get back up out of that league, given their financial advantage in the championship. Um, And this season, uh, they've actually really benefited from some positive variants. Um, their underlying performance levels. Craig have Gordon. Not... Well, <laughs> to a degree, Alan, I agree. Um, yeah. His shot stopping has been has bailed them out. Although I, I wrote an article on this, is is the command of his box is actually pretty dreadful. Um, the amount of goals that they've conceded on inside the, the goalie box off of crosses has been, you know, pretty egregious. And and um, their overall XG that they've conceded per game is actually closer to like you know seventh or eighth in the league level so to alan's point uh uh gordon's shot stopping has probably been the main uh linchpin between them being a comfortable third uh throw in a little bit of positive variance and sequencing that kind of thing versus them kind of you know uh, pulled back into that group that was really just what was there four teams or five teams that were battling to get into the top six right there um, before the pre-split, and, and I think those two issues were more um, the, the drivers, and um, you know, uh, so one of those is unlikely to recur, meaning that the variance may not be there for them um, next season. And, and again, that defensive solidity or lack thereof 
uh, for them. I mean, it's just crazy how much they give away given, you know, theoretically how much better they should be than a lot of other teams in the league. And again, you just look at like Kingsley's had a really good season. I've actually, uh, to me, he's one of the um, sleepers in the league as far as high performance levels across the board for, for a defender. Um, and, and some of their other players, you know, if you just look at them in defense, you'd be like, oh, okay, they're a pretty good player, def- you know, uh, a, a really good player uh, in, in Suter at this level. And again, just as they all piece together that midfield, it's like, ugh, you know, so it's um, not, 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 not a, not an impressive side, shall we say. So I'll, I'll be curious to see how they do in Europe, which again, if Gordon doesn't stand on his head, I suspect they're going to get shredded, but. Yeah. The defensively, they're not, <clears throat> excuse me, they're not great. I mean, to your point, their, their XG against would be equivalent to Hibs and actually worse than Aberdeen. Um, but probably a little bit better than the rest. So it's not outstanding. It's not their defense is not as good as their league position would suggest, and it's Gordon that's bailed them out. But where they do have an advantage over every other team in the league, bar the top two, is the attacking talent that they've got. So with Mackay, with Boyce, yep. with Sims, um, you know they've got they've got some really uh, at the SPFL level some really good attackers, and I think their their average XG four is like one point five, which is well above anybody else. Uh, mm. in, in the pack, so that's 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 what's got them into third place. I think is that, that their ability to outscore and Gordon to pull off more saves than he would be expected to make at the other end. But defensively and defensive midfield, they're really poor. I mean, Haring's a decent passer of the ball, but he's so slow and offers very little protection in front of the back four. This is the time of the season as well that the transfer window starts to kick in, all the rumours start to kick in. Uh, now, we've discussed the Cameron Carter-Vickers and Jota situation a couple of times already on the show, um, and we've made our sort of opinions clear on whether or not we think Celtic should try and make those permanent. And said during the week there that those deals have been in the works uh, in the background this entire time, so we'll just have to wait and see to see what happens with those deals, whether or not they go through. But uh, one player who will be at Celtic next season who was on loan, but it was a, a loan with not so much an option to buy. Celtic have to buy him, but I think they want to buy him at this point for 1.6 million. Dyson Maida, that's going to be confirmed over the next couple of weeks that he will be signing on a permanent basis for Celtic. Uh, he came to the club. Uh, he has had 20 appearances across the Premiership, the Cup and the Conference League and the League Cup. Um, so he has five goals in the league, Alan, is that correct? I'm just going off transfer marked here. So um, I think it's five goal, eight goals in total out of the 20 appearances that he's made for Celtic. That, that... Yeah, he's got uh, eight goals and f- four assists. Now, I'm, as I say, I'm quite generous on, on assists. So, for example, I'll give things like, I mean, a lot of sites now don't give assists for being brought down for a penalty, which is just madness to me. And anything anything that comes off the goalkeeper, so, if you, so I, I use the old I say, fancy football rules. If it comes off the goalkeeper and you put it in, you, then the, the person that had the original shot gets the assist. So I've got him down for four assists and eight goals in, in, in his appearances. Uh, so th- this is a player that, you know, I think out of the the signings that we brought in from Japan of Hitate, who was brought in as a quote-unquote utility player at the time, Maida was a player that most of the, uh, we'll say the data community, were, were mostly excited about Maida because of the amount of pressing uh, that he does and the numbers he puts up. So uh, has he lived up to the expectations after what you could probably describe as a slow enough start or a slow start for Celtic to Celtic fans to realize what he actually did? I, I think so. I um, Now, again, the, the caveat here is that he's played two positions. Um, so, you know, and with basically 12 games worth of league um, data, I mean, you're basically talking about a, a sample size, even that's called half for each of those positions. Um, but his overall output's been really good. I mean, his uh, total scoring contribution, you know, kind of his uh, XG and XA, has been comparable to Jota, allocated differently, meaning that he's more heavy towards the XG, less creative. Jota's um, tilted more towards um, XA. But again, some of that's because he played striker for a chunk of that. Um, And, you know, the issues around finishing, I think, you know, that finishing's probably um, one of the areas that is most um, subject to reversion and because you're not talking about a large number in any given season, even 
Um, you know, I think we're seeing some of that with Jack Amakis um, in, in his early Celtic career where he's finished very well. Um, there's not a lot of evidence that in his total career that he's, you know, uh, you know, Lewandowski or, you know what I mean? Like a real high end finisher. Um, doesn't mean that he's not getting in the right positions and taking his chances. I'm just saying that that will probably swing as we've seen with Maeda, his early arrival, his finishing wasn't great. And then it started to pick up to the point where he didn't quite catch up with his XG. But again, we're not talking about a large number of, of chances here, uh, for either of them. Uh, so over time, over a season or two or three, he'll likely see that kind of kink. And I, I haven't seen anything that suggests that he's, you know, um, technically some incompetent where he's not going to be a, at least functional at finishing. Um, and the defensive side. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it's, I, I think that is such a network issue, meaning that um, the interrelated um, coordination amongst the people pressing, I think is so important. And um, I think that's probably another thing that we'll see hopefully advance a lot next season with more time, a preseason, more players that fit, uh, and just style of play, more pace. You know, you see his his speed and the, the the quickness and the difference that makes relative to pressing. Imagine somebody I've talked about. Imagine we get a Maeda in midfield that's has that engine and the speed and the quickness within the context of of playing that attacking eight position. So, um, yeah, I've been thrilled with him, particularly given the the, the relative cost. Um, you know, I, I think for, for value for money, to me, he's probably been the biggest biggest signing in that sense. Yeah, I will say that I don't like him as a center forward. I haven't really. I, I, no, that's probably unfair to say because most of the time he's played center forward has been in a time of need and not really a tactical decision. It's been when players have been out injured, so you have to factor that in as well. But I like him more as a winger who can press high. Uh, here on and you have other players that can do the finesse like Shota or Kyoko or Jakimakis. Well, yeah, you need to have that balance. And I think Maeda, like Jakimakis, is somebody who, if you don't use them properly, they, they probably are going to look, if not ordinary, actually dreadful. Mm -hmm. The Jakimakis' record at AK Athens was dreadful. Now, I don't know how they used him. I can only, I'm just going to speculate that they thought he's a big lad, we'll stick him up front and we'll launch crosses in at him and expect him to hold the ball up. And then suddenly at Vivi Venlo, they, they used him in the way that I think he's been used today, where, where we're going to play him as a pressing centre forward who, when when the ball when we have the ball, is in and around the six-yard box and we're going to hit low crosses at him and, and, and use his instinctive finishing, which is spectacular to get the best out of them. I don't know for sure, but that's what I'm going to speculate. Now, if you if we if we if we um put, if you took Jokamakis and putting him in the Livingston team for example and played that kind of football with him, you probably would get absolutely nothing out of him. And now similar and it's similar because he's not technically um good enough to influence a game in any other way. You've got to what 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 Postacoglu has done that is that is, the, what, is what all great managers do in any walk of life is he's got the best out of certain players by asking them to focus on what they're good at and not asking them to do things that they cannot do. So if you play Maeda, uh, and for that matter, Jack and Marcus, there's going to be trade-offs, okay? So, I mean, nobody has a, a lower pass packing rate than Maeda. It's like just over one per game. <laughs> um, he doesn't have a single pass, a single secondary assisting pass so far, not one. OK, which that speaks about build up and building play and being involved in in that build up. Maeda is more about stretching the opposition, taking defenders into places that opens up space for other people. He does a lot of his best work without the ball, frankly. On the ball, he's relatively ordinary. He's not got a trick. He might run past somebody if there's like some acreage behind them and he's and, and there's space to do it. Otherwise, he's not going to try and beat a person one on one. Okay, he's not going to be even playing quick technical one twos and and third man running passes around the box. He doesn't have the vision for that. Okay, so we're not going to see any of that from him, which is what you might expect. You might want from a, a winger, and I probably just described Yota there. But what you are going to get is you're going to get absolutely prodigious um, defensive counter pressing and pressing 
uh, and work rate, you're going to get exceptional movement off the ball. You're going to get good finishing ability when you do get get him on the ball. And as, as James said, he's actually not even meeting his x his xg his expected scoring contribution is up there it's a little bit higher than yotta's actually in total and it's a little bit less than abada who everyone continually underestimates um and he's actually he's actually contributing 0.68 goals and assists per 90 minutes but his expected is 0.82 okay so providing we're getting we're playing him and using him in a manner which is best suited to into, I think I think we're going to get uh, an improvement. He's only 24. He's only just arrived in this country. He's come off a very successful full season in Japan, where presumably, where, where I know he's been, you know, more sprints, covering more kilometers at speed than any other player in the league. Or I think there might be one that's similar. Um, and so, you know, I, I expect to see a refreshed and uh, energized uh, Maeda and Hitati, for that matter, after and and Kyogo uh, next season. But but like with Jack and Marcus, you have to use them in a sensible way, which Apostokogli evidence Apostokogli will, but be be cognizant of that there will be limitations for this yeah. player. Yeah, and I, yeah. I'll just add one thing on Maeda. I, I see him as, as I, uh, in my nerd speak, I see him scaling very well in the Champions League, meaning that we're, we're not going to have as much as the ball, most likely, um, and there's going to be space and hit a player of his ability where we're going to need him to help on on the defending side, but also to get in behind, you know, kind of like what we saw at times in the Betis games and the Leverkusen games um, is, is when we countered and we, you know, cut through the midfield. Remember that great uh, long uh, Jota pass for that uh, goal with Kyoko, um, you know, that kind of play is going to be, you know, probably vitally important for us to be able to create chances and score against that kind of pot two and pot one type of team. Um, and so I'd see Maeda, you know, probably none of our wingers are going to be able to take on upper tier Champions League fullbacks and smoke them one on one with a large degree of consistency. Right. I mean, we talked about it earlier in the season, Jota's one on one effectiveness against Aaron Ramsey got diluted quite a bit. Uh, so the idea that he's going to go up against a Bayern Munich right back or a left back and just, you know, is he going to beat him sometimes? Probably. But he's, my point is to dominate, like to impose your style of play. And that's where I think um, Maeda's strengths probably are a really good fit on a relative basis compared to what we're going to face and what we're going to need to do to hopefully compete at, at that level. Mm -hmm. Kevin 14, who's a regular commenter on YouTube has made a good point that he, he thinks that Maeda and Jota are great together with the ability to rotate, rotate on wings. And that's something you do see quite a bit with them too. And I, I noticed it when I was over and it's fun. You do notice these things a lot more when you're at the games, but when I was at the Ross County game, like one minute you looked and left wing was Maeda and then the next minute he was over in the right wing and Jota was on the left. It's it's really good interchangeable qualities that they have. So um, that's definitely well, something you can bring. Well, I know Lennon said recently that he's borrowed some stuff after watching Ange. I think Ange borrowed that from Lennon, watching Lennon last season and prior seasons mm. as far as switching those wingers. No, yeah, but it's, it's, sure. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balance of capabilities, right? I mean, Jota's by any measure a creative player you know he finds uh he, he, he can beat people with passes he can create chances for people through a variety of through long crosses short crosses low balls high balls Maida doesn't have any of that in his in his makeup really um, but what he does have is exceptional movement so you're making defenders think in very different ways um and, and, and as we've seen you know this the stat that we keep trotting out about Celtic not conceding in the last 20 minutes of any game since the first game of the season we, we uh, you know, we we meant not just mentally but physically tire teams out, and some of it's just to do with that that different problems that you're asking defenders to solve by chasing Kyogo, chasing Maeda, tracking their runs, wondering whether they're going to go into out or out to in, or going to switch or go diagonal or, or go go direct, and then you've got Jota, you know, he's going to take you on, he's going to test you. Uh, it's very different. So, you'd, but you need that balance. So, for example, you couldn't have Jakamakis and then Kyogo and Maeda. You just you just have no it's just no not enough creativity there. You'd have three people mm. running around, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it'd be probably great for Matt O'Reilly. He'd probably love that. He'd have all these targets to hit, maybe. But uh, you need you need that balance. I think I think that your turn, Maeda playing together gives you that balance. 
Yeah, the ball wouldn't stick to them too well. Um, if you had all three no. of them running in different directions. Um, so just as we begin to wrap this up, then Dundee United up tomorrow night. I mean, I, it it doesn't really make a difference if Celtic win this game or lose this game. It ultimately uh, is probably going to end up with the same outcome. But you want them to win, and you want them to bring another win into the the game of the season. This was actually where Celtic lost the title last year. This is where it was confirmed that Rangers were uh, champions um, last season. So it's, it's nice a little bit of symmetry there that Celtic are going into this game um, knowing that they are champions elect so far. So are we expecting anything different from Celtic tomorrow or same as usual? I, my, my guess is uh, same as usual, I suspect, um, with you know the official clinching of the league um, potential at hand um, that we're going to want to win the game. And uh, so that I, I, uh, Ange doesn't strike me as someone who's going to take anything for granted. Um, so I suspect we'll play some iteration of best 11 with maybe some rotation given given the midweek game. Um, and, you know, I am guessing Dundee United will follow what they've done most of the season. They've started focusing on uh, youth so they might even have some a, a younger composition of players filter, you know, kind of mixed in. Um, and they, they've tried to go for the most part toe to toe against us. Um, and, and that leaves again, they have a keeper that could have one of these worldly games, as I mentioned before, uh, the hearts game. Um, you know, Seacrest is, is a good enough shot stopper. They could have one of those games where he stops everything. But I, I, I suspect that's probably their only chance because I, I think they're very unlikely to just bunker. I think they'll try to play, particularly being at home um, and how they've played us up until till now. So barring Seagrass standing on his head, it should be a, a good uh, celebratory performance, hopefully. Yeah, I'll be a little bit more cautious. Um you know they've actually only lost four of the last fifteen league games, and that was to us, to the Rangers, to Harps, and to Livingston. And apart from the the game at the weekend there, the Ibrox all by one goal. Okay, so they've really tightened up, and they've found ways to get points from all the other teams in the league. And and that and what that's given them is a shot at European football. Okay, so they're actually in pole position now. Um, you know they're they're what point ahead of Motherwell. The three points ahead of Ross County, so they've got a lot to play for. Because I imagine, you know, European football will be tr- transformative at some level, um, and allow them to keep keep some young players and maybe get a couple more experienced ones in. So, I, I kind of think this will be quite a tough game on that basis. You know, the, the, I, I, I think in the in in the past games of the season, they've maybe not played terribly smart against Celtic. I know they, I know they got a draw um, and took us to the 90th minute in the two games at Celtic Park. Uh, but at home, we've been able to, when they've been at home, sorry, we've been able to open them up in the cup and in the 3-0 game pretty easily. Um, I suspect for this game, they know that if they get a point out of it, that that's going to be be a big deal for them, given their European aspirations. So I suspect they are going to be quite tight. And I think it could actually be mm-hmm. quite a tricky game. We shall wait and see. Hopefully, mm-hmm. it'll be another win. I I know I, I did mention this on the podcast, but anybody who missed it, I'll actually be on the road for this. So I'll be on the ferry going across the Bilbao at the point in time when this game is on. So whether or not I get to see it is going to be largely dependent on whether there's a TV or whether the Wi-Fi is good enough to watch this game. So um, hopefully I'll get to see a little bit of it at least. And uh, if anybody is wondering where I'm going, I'm going to Spain and there is a new YouTube channel that I'm going to plug on this podcast shamelessly. Um, the Football Wanderer is the name of the YouTube channel. The link is in the description below. If you want to follow me, I'm going to be going to some grounds and hopefully hopefully getting in some uh, La Liga games as well. We're into the playoffs, or going to, going to be into the playoffs uh, in Spain. So there might be actually a couple of second uh, uh, division games that I'll be going to in my first couple of weeks in the north of Spain. So cool. that'll, be, that'll be pretty interesting uh, to get a chance to get to a couple of grounds. So if you want to follow that, uh, do uh, click into the link in the description and, and give the uh, channel a subscription as well. Um, and of course, this will be continuing on the road until the end of the season, at least. Kevin14 you- is asking about some breakdowns on potential signings. They will be coming. Any player that signs for Celtic will do a breakdown, but I don't think we're going to bother doing getting involved in the transfer rumours just yet. Do you abla? No. Do you abla, Enda? 
Uh, Niabla. No, Niabla. Ni- Niabla. Was that was that uh, part Japanese, part uh, Spanish? Niabla. Probably a mixture of ni- pick, mixture of Irish. Oh, okay. <laughs> to Donegal and uh, <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> All right. I, I, have, I, have, I have that Duolingo bird giving out to me every day that I'm not following up on my uh, Spanish lessons. So I'll, I'll, I'll try my best, you know. All right. It'll do you no good in Bilbao. They don't speak Spanish. <laughs> no, this is, this, this is true. This is, a, this, this is a fair point. But, it's a beautiful, um, it was, I would look, say it's a uh, beautiful place, but it's a really friendly place. Amazing people. Uh, Bilbao is great fun. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to getting into some of the grub that they have up that region as well. So well, yeah. uh, that's that's what's coming for me over the next couple of weeks. And the Huddle Breakdown will be with you as well. Uh, whether or not I will be on it will be Wi-Fi dependent as well. So we might have to leave you in the, the warm hands of these two lads for the next couple of weeks. But we shall wait and see. And we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll pull out we'll, the instructions we'll see how... again. Thanks a lot. And I'm going to yeah, have to dig out yeah, the instructions yeah. email. Don't let that uh, don't let let that deter you for the next couple of weeks of the huddle breakdown. Join us uh, once again while Celtic chase this title. They're pretty much champions, but over the next couple of weeks, hopefully they will wrap it up for for uh, for good. James Allen, thanks very much as always. Yep, safe Thank travels. You. Yes, enjoy and safe travels. Yeah, and we'll chat to you on the other side. Good luck. Mm-hmm.